All right. Looks like we are having some issues here. Let's see. Make sure everything is brought in and good. Put that in. Put that in. As you know, we got to always let it breathe and make sure we get all the rooms in here. See if we can't get go live. Green check marks. Green check marks across the board. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining the Dove Valley Deep Divers. Obviously, it is not a typical Friday night. Lance is not with me, obviously, uh, which means you're stuck with me having to run the show. And I, for that, I am sorry. Um, Lance is out of town. He's away spending some time with his family. Make sure um, so some bad stuff's happened uh, recently. Make sure you guys send him some well wishes. Uh, don't want to go into it a lot, but everybody in this family is okay. Um, but there was a car accident. So sending our best wishes to our my good friend and co-host's way. But tonight joining me is another good friend of mine, a guy that I've known for many years now, was one of the guys who, if I, I always get this wrong, he is the one who actually came up with the name Mile High Huddle. Um, so he was there for the creation of it, remained good friends. Um, Luke, it's good to have you joining me. Why don't you go ahead and, you know, all of your experience coaching, go ahead and, uh, give us a little bit of a background about yourself. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. Always good to be here. It's funny. I think we've probably lost count of, you know, however many years we've been friends. I, I feel like I've kind of lost count at this point of how many years I've been on the podcast. Cause I know it's, it's been a few at this point. So um, I guess the one thing I do at least have some good concrete counting ability over is my years in college football. Um, so this is going to be year number eight for me in college football. Um, currently, I'm the quarterbacks coach and special teams coordinator here at Juniata College. Um, we're a small D3 school in central Pennsylvania. Um, but, you know, like I said, year number eight for me of college football, mainly spent on the offensive side of the ball, have coached quarterbacks here for the last um, I guess over a year now, um, I've coached receivers, tight ends, running backs, um, spent a year dabbling with coaching the linebackers. So, um, you know, just very fortunate to, to get to call myself a college football coach, be able to do this as a career. And um, so, like I said, I'm, I haven't run out of fingers to count on yet. So um, uh, grateful as always for the opportunity to hop on and, and join you. And um, obviously tonight kind of talk something a little bit near and dear to my heart in the uh, quarterback position. Yeah. I mean, it's been, you know, a hot topic issue here with the Broncos, uh, the quarterback, what's next, you know, the failure that was the Russell Wilson experiment. Um, we have two quarterbacks on roster in Jared Stidham and Ben DiNucci. So obviously it is. I know that I reached out to you, I believe it was back in like January or February about trying to get you on a couple times. Unfortunately, that wasn't, we weren't able to work that out. Um, but it's always good to have you on. Always good to join you, get your expertise um, and get your thoughts on everything. I mean, typically it's been wide receivers. So it's nice to get your take on some quarterbacks. And uh, well, you're giving the background on yourself. I realized we met in 2013. <laughs> 2013. Wow. Um, so this is my, what, 12th draft, 11th draft doing this. And I've known you for just as long. Um, and it's, uh, it's a privilege to, you know, call you a friend. Uh, we have David McElrath coming in, Papa Bear coming in with a $2 donation. Thank you, Papa Bear. We appreciate that. He says, good evening, Broncos country, Eric and coach. Uh, thank you, David. Again, we appreciate that so much. Um, and then Zach Powers here, he comes in with a comment as well. Love the di to see different takes and evaluations when it comes to this quarterback class. And yeah, that's always one thing that I always try. Even if I disagree with somebody with in their final result on it, um, uh, on an evaluation of a player, it's still always nice to hear what they have to say because sometimes that can influence you a little bit. For me, I know a lot of times it leads to me going back and watching a little bit more. Maybe I missed something or maybe I just come away more confused you know, set on what I believe about a player. It's always nice to get more, you know, opinions about players, more evaluations, and just see what all, uh, what all there is out there and all, all the different takes. Um, I asked you to look at a handful of quarterbacks, no Jane Daniels, no Caleb Williams. Um, we kind of let those guys out because th those guys are the projected to be the top two picks. Um, I think it's pretty much cemented that Caleb Williams is going first overall to the bears the question is, is Jaden Daniels going number two? And most people believe that's the case. 
going to the commanders, but Drake may, there's been a lot of people talking about him falling a little bit. JJ McCarthy, Bo Nix, Michael Penix, Spencer Radler, and Michael Pratt, I believe are all the quarterbacks I had you look at. So Luke, first off, I want to get to which of these guys did you like best? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think the interesting thing about this class is, you know, you're seeing college wide, college football wide across the landscape. You know, what is everybody talking about right now? I mean, probably right behind NIL, people are talking about the transfer portal. And this is kind of one of the first times where I guess I've seen, you know, not just one guy, but, you know, several guys across the course of a class. Now we're talking about who have been starters at two different programs. Right. And you see that across this class of guys who transferred to find a home to kind of find a better opportunity for themselves. Um, you know, I'm going to forget some, but I mean, the two you mentioned, right? Caleb Williams starting at Oklahoma, ending up at USC, Jaden Daniels transferring, um, you know, Bo Nix, Michael Penix, Spencer Rattler, right? This is, we're kind of starting to see this really make an appearance. And I know you and I kind of, um, you'd mentioned this in a message the other day is kind of comparing guys starts who started more than one year. Well, it's interesting also to kind of start to think about as guys adjust and they adapt from one scheme to another, in what ways is that going to make it an easier transition in the pros where they have already adjusted from one scheme to the next in college, right? Obviously that's going to rule out a guy like, you know, Caleb Williams. Yeah. He changed, he changed homes. He went to his nice little penthouse in LA but he didn't, he didn't change schemes, right? He, cause he went with Lincoln Riley. So kind of going back to, to what you kind of originally asked, you know, in terms of guys, I like the most shoot, man. I, I think that two guys that really jumped out to me were for various reasons, for different reasons, Drake may and JJ McCarthy. Um, I know there's a kind of narrative around JJ McCarthy that he's, I don't know, maybe a little bit of a, a stodgy player, right. That, you know, Michigan didn't trust him in the big moments. And, you know, that's there's something to that. Um, you know, I think statistically when the game is on the line, you know, he handed the ball off uh, and they didn't really trust him to go out there maybe and win the games. That's an outside assumption, right? Because if you if you look at their program, they're they're fundamentally based on establishing the run and dominating in the trenches at the line of scrimmage. So, again, they're, they're a program that's going to put their emphasis on when the game is on the line, we're going to hand the ball off and we're going to go. We're going to go get yards, first downs, and scores. Um, so I came away impressed with McCarthy, and I'm sure we'll kind of get into that more. Um, you know, in terms of Drake May, he's a guy you're gambling on the upside. Um, there's a little bit of erraticness to him right now. I'm sure we'll kind of go into more depth on that later. But you're looking at a guy like that and saying, hey, this is a guy who we think has all the talent, all the tools, um, all the, you know, kind of the all the ability to be a significantly good NFL quarterback. We're just going to have to polish around the edges a little bit too. Yeah, I definitely agree there. And um, from listening to like guys like Bucky Brooks, Dane Brugler, Daniel Jeremiah, that erratic erraticness of Drake may that has been a pretty hot topic. That's been going around. Some of them are talking about how, you know, he was just trying to push himself to be, you know, cement himself in that conversation with Caleb Williams as being the top guy, which I'm sure that, you know, that mental aspect was some of it. The UNC roster wasn't very good. Um, some questionable talent on the offensive line outside of one receiver who he's entering this class. And I have a lot of questions about the receiver as well. He didn't have as much talent. He lost two big guys that were part of his receiving cores from last or from the 2022 season. So that erratic erraticness, could stem from multiple things for it but one thing that they that these guys always brought out again brugler bucky brooks daniel jeremiah was these inconsistent technical aspects to it from you know his low his base when it comes to throwing to even some inconsistencies with his throwing motion leading to also you know erraticness with the play what are what are your thoughts with you know the overall technique starting with the footwork yeah, I thought of, you know, of the kind of the guys that I ended up breaking down and, you know, obviously didn't I, I wasn't able to get to everyone in the class. But of the ones I did watch, you know, I would say for for me, those were the top two quarterbacks, technically, mechanically. Um, I think they're they're two very different sides of the coin. To me, J.J. McCarthy, it's it's drilled. You can tell he has worked the footwork. He has worked the techniques. Um 
you know, I, I, I kind of the way I, I watched it and I kind of compared it almost to like a metronome, right, where it's just nice and rhythmic and he's in rhythm. He knows what he's doing. He's a well-oiled machine. And there's just something not not robotic, but there is something very measured in how he plays the position um, to me watching Drake may it's casual. It seems natural. And in, in that sense, it's, it's a little bit more effortless for his footwork, his timing, his rhythm. Um, I, I would say for me, a lot of where he kind of gets into trouble. Yeah. As you mentioned, it's his base taking long strides and kind of, you know, throwing off his center of gravity a little bit um, for me in coaching the quarterback position. One, one thing that, I really emphasize that we really emphasize here is talking about throwing from what we call prime. Um, obviously, shout out to, to Deion Sanders, coach prime. But when we say prime, we mean our prime throwing position, right? I'm in a comfortable throwing position. I've got a good base. I'm able to throw off my back foot, generate force from my back midfoot. I can step and I can drive the ball, right? And, and ultimately, that's the ultimate measure of a quarterback in some ways as a pure passer. When he's maneuvering in the pocket, when he's navigating inside the pocket or outside the pocket, how quickly is he able to get to prime where now I'm ready to throw, right? And so for me, that's where, you know, Drake May, when he kind of takes those longer strides, yeah, it takes him that kind of half second longer to get back to prime because as we know, the great ones are able to throw when they're not in that prime position. Patrick Mahomes, right? Patrick Mahomes to me is frankly speaking, is probably one of the worst things to happen to QB development in the last 10 years, because you've got a guy with an all universe arm talent who can make these ridiculous throws off platform outside of prime. And then every, every kid in high school looks at that and says, Hey, I can do that. And the truth of the matter is maybe not right. Because he, again, we're talking about a guy who has an all galaxy arm. Um, so again, I, I realize I'm kind of getting on a tangent here. You're, you'll have to bear with me. Like I said, I'm passionate about QBs. Um, but that's one thing to me where mechanically those two are fundamentally very, very good. JJ's probably a little bit better drilled, right? McCarthy, it's just a little bit more rhythmic. He, he has the feel for it. Whereas May, it's a little bit more natural. It's a little bit more fluid. Yeah, there's a question I want to come back to, but first, got to say thank you to Gary Palmer with the $10 donation. Thank you, Gary. We appreciate that. Saying hi, Eric, and good to see you again, coach. Yes, definitely. It is good to have Luke back on here. And Mount Rouge 05 says, thoughts on Keaton Slovis? What round? What tier in this class? Can he be a dark horse candidate? Does he have enough for his draft stock to rise? For me, I don't know how much Luke can offer in about Keaton, Keaton Slovis. For me, He's a guy that's an undrafted free agent. Bring him in, you know, see if he can compete. I think that there's a possibility that he has a great career as a coach. Um, or, you know, we see him following as, you know, JT O'Sullivan, what Chase Daniel is doing now, um, you know, being that private quarterback coach or coach on a football team. That, to me, is more of his future than actual NFL quarterback, personally. Do you have any thoughts about Keaton Slovis? Uh, I'm going to be honest with you here. I, I haven't watched enough of him to really have an opinion, and I, I'm not going to just give you a half baked one just just to have one. So I wish I wish I could give you more on that one. I wasn't sure since he was in the he was in the neighborhood. Uh, so <laughs> I know being being a pit just a couple hours west, no doubt. Uh, Phil coming in saying, good evening, Eric and coach. If the portal is open and a team like Denver is looking, what quarterback would say I want to transfer to Denver? Hashtag Buckham with a B. Hashtag MHH for life. Um, yeah, and that's that's a good point. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where you're coming at with that, Phil, because the way I'm taking it is this roster may not be the best and what quarterback would want to come here and deal with it. Um, I think that there's enough talent on the offense that can be enticing for multiple quarterbacks. Um, but, you know, when good thing with the draft is Players don't get really much of a say about where they go. If the Broncos want somebody, they can definitely go out there and get them, which has been a big topic of conversation, obviously, moving up for a quarterback. But before I get to asking you a question about that aspect of it, um, I forgot what the other question was that I was going to come back to now. Um, with okay, with the you know the drilling be uh, the footwork and stuff, the lower body mechanics being drilled into McCarthy. How much of that would you say is that's just typical Harbaugh? Yeah. Uh, and I think so much of, 
so much of Michigan this year across the board is you look at that program and you say, shoot, man, that's a well-oiled machine, Mm -hmm. right? Those guys, they looked prepared. They looked well-drilled. They were well-coached. Um, obviously that's a program that has been building their standards for, you know, for some time, right. Um, you know, you, you look at the, I've, I've seen and heard some, some great work on, you know, Hey, head coaches from when they were hired, how long does it take them to win their first national championship? Right. And Harbaugh is probably one of the longer ones in recent memory. Um, but you can tell that program placed a very high emphasis on, um, on coaching and on the details, right? And it's those little details that make championship standard programs. And obviously Michigan is the ultimate representative of that at the moment, being the reigning national champions. Um, and I think a big part of that is, you know, I've I've been able to kind of hear just through like clinics, everything like that and coaching circles, kind of hear a little bit about the way that Michigan coaches the quarterbacks. And, you know, it is very detailed. That That is a big focus of certainly Harbaugh. And again, that's something that, you know, as as a football coach, you expect him to bring now to a place like the Chargers, right? Um, to kind of bring that relentless attention to detail. And again, as you think back about kind of all of the great coaches, certainly in the last few years, um, you know, it, certainly in college, right? Like it's it's the Sabins, it's the Kirby Smarts, right? It's those guys who are just relentless, detail specific, just detail hounds, right. That are going to just absolutely find the little details and, and, and hammer down on those. So yeah, I certainly think that's, that, that's, that screams Harbaugh to me. Yeah. I mean, going beyond just the quarterback position, there is about 500,000 Michigan prospects in this year's draft. (laughs) And I don't think I've noted a single one of them as not having like well-developed technique entering the NFL. It's just everything. The fundamentals are pretty consistent and clean. There's some guys that have lapses every now and then, but you know, most prospects in college, they have lapses, even the NFL stars. So sometimes there's a lapse in their, in their techniques and everything, but they are such a well-coached bunch, which makes me absolutely terrified of having Harbaugh in the division, working with somebody like Justin Herbert. Now, before we move on to the next couple quarterbacks, one final question or two final questions here. First one is if you had to make a comparison for Drake May and JJ McCarthy, who would they be? Because I have one in mind for Drake May that I don't love it, but I like it. And JJ McCarthy to me is kind of a, an enigma when trying to compare him to somebody. Oh man, you, comparisons are probably not my forte and you're, you're painting me here into a, in a, into a corner here. Um, I would say to me, JJ McCarthy, I, I would say from, from the perspective of just, like I said, how much of a footwork rhythmic player he is, um, to me, what they did was they put him in a, in a position schematically for Michigan, right? Michigan runs. And again, I'll, I'll kind of take a step back here from an overall view, right? You look at some of the quarterbacks in this class that are not running necessarily the most complicated offensive schemes. That's not, that's neither a plus nor a negative, right? Maybe the program is saying, Hey, we don't think we have a guy to do a lot of complicated stuff. Or they're saying, Hey, we want to be simple maybe because we want to play fast. Right. And if you if you're a super fast paced offensive scheme, you can't really get too complicated because if you stop and think now you're not playing fast. Right. So for one reason or another, obviously, right. McCarthy is in a little bit more of a complicated scheme. So, again, you're painting me into an into a corner here. Um, I think just from and this is not like a stylistic. This is not like a playing comparison or anything but just thinking of a guy who's kind of from a complicated you know college scheme who who you think of as just being really rhythmic really good with his footwork again this is no by no means a player comparison but just an overall kind of feel mannerism I think of like I don't know a Kirk Cousins right who's from maybe a little bit more of a complicated you know pro style air quotes college offense but just someone who is a technician is really good technically um Drake May, man, now now I'm I'm, I'm kind of a little bit looser here. Um, again, like I said, it's it's got to be a guy who's maybe a little bit looser. Um, I, I'd be I, truthfully, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this back at you and and say I'd love to hear who you have in mind, and then I'll just react to that. 
Well, Kirk Cousins is definitely a good one for McCarthy, and there's some stylistic comparisons there. And one thing to remember, and I'm not a big fan of comparisons myself, just because so often it's taken as a one-for-one. This guy compares to this guy, so that means this guy is that guy. And that's not the case. Um, So when I look at, when I watch Drake May, a lot of what I see in him, a lot of the vibes that I get from him is very similar to the same, you know, vibes, things I saw when I was watching Justin Herbert coming out of Oregon. Are they the exact same? By no means. But there are so many similarities there with it that obviously, you know, I can pinpoint like, or pick it, oh, this isn't quite, you know, his arm may not be as talented as Justin Herbert's or as natural or whatever. But to me, there are a lot of, a lot of similarities between those two uh, from when I evaluated Justin Herbert just a handful of years ago. Yeah, I, I don't mind that. I don't mind that comparison. I think, again, kind of like Herbert, he's decisive when he has to use his legs, but he doesn't go out of his way to use his legs necessarily. Um some mechanics to clean up, but again, just a very casual eff- effortless player. Right. Um, and, and, you know, it's funny for, for me is, and this is kind of a broader discussion about quarterback mechanics, but if you, if you just looked at his upper body of the guys I watched his, his upper body looks like he's throwing with a bad arm. Like he just looks like he has a weak arm from the waist up. But to me, quarterback mechanic wise, really where you generate your power on the ball is from the, from the waist down. It's from the lower half. Um, so it's, it's funny to watch him because he almost looks like he's kind of trying to push the ball and put too much on it because he doesn't have his weakened arm, but the ball zips off because of zips off his hand because of his lower, lower half when he's able to kind of find that prime position position we talked about. Now, before we get to the next quarterbacks, so there's a couple que- another question, but Michael Ronquillo coming in. Good evening, Eric and Coach Luke, or with Coach Luke on the Dove Valley Deep Drivers Go Broncos. Thank you, Michael, for joining us. Unfortunately, we also do not have Scott in the background tonight. Um, I believe he should be back next week. Uh, so if you guys are doing stars through Facebook, I can't see that. Um, but if you're donating stars and I don't catch it, I apologize. But I thank you so much for your donation. Um, Lawrence Rivera coming in with a $5 donation saying what up coach and Eric, what positions are best to help any young quarterback succeed, succeed as rookies. And I think to me that there's an obvious one, having wide receiver talent to help ease that for quarterbacks definitely has to be up there and a strong running game as well. Something to help, you know, when things are getting a little bit tough for the quarterback, something to take the pressure off of them and let them just get back into the groove. But I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are. Yeah, I would say I think you kind of hit the nail on the head is, you know, outside of the five guys in front of him and keeping the quarterback upright, because that's that's critical, as we know, you know, it's yeah, it's it's that I have a dynamic target outside. I have a number one guy who I'm going to put the ball up to and I know he's going to go up and he's going to get it. Or, hey, I know I got I've got a guy right next to me in the backfield and he's going to make me look real good when I catch the snap and give him the ball. Right. And, and sometimes it's as simple as that, is having a guy that you trust next to you in the backfield who you know you can hand the ball to, who you know is going to is block his butt off and he's going to do a great job for you in, in pass protection so that you can get the ball and lay it up and take your one-on-one matchups and go, you know, have a guy who's going to go up and get it. Yeah, definitely. Um, so going back to the one question, and it, this is going to carry over into the next couple quarterbacks that we talk about is Nick and I, we've had a couple conversations, and I don't know if it's in the, been in the group chat or privately between him and I, but one thing we talk about a lot is when throwing the ball, does the ball look light versus heavy? And what, when we talk about that is we prefer the ball to look, have, look heavy, like there's some weight to it, like there's some velocity, there's some power behind it, whereas light, it just kind of floats and flutters, um, might take a little extra second, might have a higher arc on those deeper shots than you know, as ideal. Um, so when you, with that in mind, I don't know how, I don't know if you look at things the same kind of way as we do, but when it comes to Drake May and uh, JJ McCarthy with the light, with the ball looking light versus heavy, what would you say is, you know, more suiting for them? Is the ball coming out looking heavy or is the ball coming out looking light? 
Yeah. I I think we're saying we would be saying the same things in, in our lingo here um, at Juniata. We'd kind of talk about being able to drive the ball, right? Be able to kind of put some some zip on that ball, some mustard. Um, you know, so for us, we would we would talk about driving the ball as opposed to, like you said, kind of floating it a little bit more. I think I think the thing that they both of those guys do very effectively is they do step in and they do drive the ball. And, and so much, like I said, I kind of just touched on mechanically, so much of that, your power, your strength as a passer doesn't come from your arm. I think that's a complete misconception that people have. Um, it's not about, you know, being able to lay up and, yeah, I can, you know, I can throw just with my arm, right? You know, it's, it's the classic everyone remembers, Jamarcus Russell throwing 70 yards on a knee. Well, yeah, that's, that's arm strength, but that's not where arm talent comes into play and really where your power and strength should be generated is from your lower half. If we're getting real specific, um, anyone who who knows me as a coach is going to kind of roll their eyes when I say this, but we talk about midfoot force, um, which is really from your back foot. If you divide your back, your foot into like thirds, you've got the toe, you've got the midfoot, and then you've got the heel. It's right off that midfoot of being able to kind of screw your arch into the ground a little bit and drive off that, that's where you get juice on the ball. That's where you're able to create that drive, throw those heavy balls, right? And that, to me, that's where I think those guys do a good job with it is because they are able to get that back cleat in the ground and really create all of their force from the ground up through that back cleat. Um, so I, I would say both of those guys do a tremendous job of, as you say, throwing a heavy ball because they're able to drive from the ground up mechanically yeah and i'm glad you actually touch on that about the arm strength and everything because that's one thing i talk about not so much with quarterbacks but especially with offensive line it's not always about that upper body power obviously though that can help with controlling blocks but it's in defensive linemen as well it's about being able to torque that body that power from the lower half to get them up and get them back on their heels and then be able to use that power and control or drive or everything a lot of power and a lot of different aspects when it comes to football comes from the lower half and basically kind of generates up there's an old superhero movie i believe where they actually touch on that about how you just kind of like let it all just like roll up and vibrate up throughout and then coming to your uh, out your fingertips might be an anime as well i can't fully remember i just remember watching it many years ago um but we have peter middleton coming in saying hello from thailand and that this is his sixth country he's watched dvdd from you know, that is a great way to show that Broncos country isn't a geographical location, but a state of being. We have Pearl Heater coming in saying Hell, hi to Michael. Saw a couple comments earlier saying that you're having a computer and iPhone and pad, iPad problems today. I am, and that you're back. That's good news. Always sucks having any kind of technical issues. We have Cal coming in saying hi, specifically hi to left side Eric. I know it feels weird having me on this side of it. Normally I, I'm in Lance's spot and it just feels weird. Um, Doug Tess here coming in. The only way Denver gets May or JJ is that they move up to three. And I don't think that will happen. Um, I don't think it's only to three. I think it's three or four. They can come away with one of them. But as I've said for weeks on end, I don't see the Broncos getting up there. Uh, just the cost to move up with the fact that they haven't had a first round pick for the last couple of years um, due to a couple of trades, how they don't have a second round pick this year. It just makes it all harder to get up there unless they wanted to move Patrick Sertan. And I don't think they want to move Patrick Sertan. Um, and then seeing real quick. Uh, so Phil can come. Phil's coming in. Has Coach Luke seen any quarterbacks that could be a developmental sleeper? I obviously due to time, he has spring ball going on and stuff as well. So I couldn't have him sit there and watch all the quarterbacks in this class. I did limit it down to, I believe, six. Um, but one of them, one of them might be able to fall into that quarter category. And we'll get to that here in just a few minutes, Phil, but the next two quarterbacks I want to talk about, they're kind of in that second tier. Um, they're kind of, there's kind of, you know, Drake may JJ McCarthy. Those are two guys that full expectation is they'll be gone by six overall, maybe even seeing quarterbacks go one through four. The next two is one of them is very oftenly mocked to the Broncos at 12 overall. But whenever what during the analysis, this is all this is funny to me, is every single time basically that I see him mocked to 
the Denver at number 12, it always comes with, I would like to see Denver try to trade down, see Denver trade down and land him. I don't think this is the right spot for him. I think that Denver will try to trade down something along those lines of trading down and then getting him later. And that is the Oregon quarterback, Bo Nix. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about him. I've made my thoughts about Bo Nix uh, heard and felt for multiple weeks on the value drivers. So Luke, what are your thoughts on Bo Nix? Yeah. And it's funny you, that you kind of go to Bo Nix after the discussion we were just having about, you know, where quarterbacks generate force, because to me, the thing that just jumped out. And again, I, I'm not in every every one of these buildings. I don't know what these quarterbacks are being coached to do. For me as a quarterback coach, when I look at Bo Nix, the thing that jumps out to me is his feet are a little bit the, the toes. How do I put this? The toes are almost kind of sprayed out. Right. So normally if you're in a stance, right, you get these very like parallel feet, right? Parallel toes like this. His feet are almost a little bit like this when he's dropping back. And if you it, don't watch, don't watch his bubbles, don't watch his screens, watch his dropbacks where he's going through three step drops, you know, open step footwork, whatever the case may be, right? Where he's now dropping back. And again, his feet are, are you know, it's not that they're wide, it's not that they're tight, it's just that his toes are pointed out and where that becomes difficult again bear with me here is where you're trying to generate that midfoot force if you're trying to generate your midfoot force right off of here but all of a sudden it's tilted out wide now you almost have to kind of close that toe to be able to throw the ball and to be able to deliver it so to me yes he kind of has a weird arm motion in terms of a little bit you know he kind of slings the ball he kind of chucks the ball more than he throws it um but I think his feet and, and by extension, his base is is a mechanical issue that someone's probably going to have to correct with him. Not saying it's unfixable, but again, you're, if you're a team who's looking at a bow next year, gambling on saying, hey, we, we love this guy because he's got, you know, more college starting experience than literally anyone ever has. Yes, he's got this mechanical error, but guess what? We're going to back in our quarterback coach and our offensive coordinator to be able to develop this guy. I think in terms of the way he throws the ball, he's very dynamic over the middle, short because his feet, he he has a good enough arm to be able to overcome those. It's those wider balls that I think he struggles with a little bit more because that's when you really have to drive that ball off your back foot. And that's where having a back foot that's so kind of tilted out wide, I think that that's a little bit more challenging for him mechanically. Yeah, definitely. And one thing is going back to that whole light ball versus heavy ball. One thing, Nick's was always a topic of conversation between Nick and I with this. It's a light ball. It's pretty consistently. And there was a throw at the combine where they were, you know, hitting those nine routes and he goes and it just like it dies in the air and it just basically comes takes a straight line down um and well you don't see that a lot on tape and he has there's enough arm strength to make the end you know that pure arm strength to make those nfl throws as you touch on there are some mechanical aspects that can help um and improve it a little bit and be able to touch on a little bit more consistency or consistently one thing that stands out to me and i'm going to use a couple terms here that i know that you hate um, one of them being college offense. Oregon doesn't exactly have that pro style offense. Um, you know, it's very much very heavy, a lot of screen usage. Um, you know, getting guys get the ball quickly, letting them make plays to where 70% of Nix's throws over the last two seasons were either were not beyond 10 yards, they were either up to the 10 yard mark or behind the line of scrimmage. Well, we go back to Auburn, and Auburn, there was a little bit more of a pro style offense when he was there. And we just com- we just saw him just basically completely, you know, fail almost. He, he, granted, those teams, those Auburn teams weren't full of talent, but just everything as a quarterback with him was he's a guy that you just can't touch as a quarterback. I mean, I remember to, before he transferred to Oregon, the conversation was, is he a running back? Is he a tight end? Same kind of conversation that we we're having about Debo. Um, how much do you put on? Or do you, how much, that's the right way to put this. How much does that, the struggles in that pro style type offense at Auburn kind of affect your thought process with Bo Nix currently? 
at the end of the day, sometimes it's beneficial, and and certainly he took advantage of this to get a change of scenery. Uh, it, it's I think sometimes it's important to just kind of change your setting, change what you're being asked to do, and um, obviously he he did that and went to Oregon. Now again, Oregon, as you say, is not the most complicated offense in the world. It's certainly not pro style. A lot of empty sets, identifying just best matchups and taking advantage of that. Now whether that is a choice that Oregon deliberately made by saying, oh, we don't think Bo can run a complicated offense. I don't know. You know, it could it could be that. It could just as equally be saying, hey, this is how we want to do is we want to exploit. We feel like we've got some really dynamic playmakers. We can move them around and spread them out and empty, and that makes it easier for our quarterback, whoever that guy may be, to be able to identify that, right? So that's not something where you I don't think you can just put a pin in it and say, hey, this is, you know, they didn't believe in Bo Nix to get this done. Now, maybe. Maybe that's certainly possible, but, you know, I think without being in that room, there's really no way of knowing. Um, so that that's kind of where it's interesting to me of, you know, certainly you, you, you can't know the reasons behind why he, he was asked to do the things he was, but all you can evaluate is, Hey, how was he good at doing them? Right. How did he go out and execute that offense? Cause it's one thing to say, well, maybe this offense was just kind of right up to his ceiling and they didn't go, they didn't push past that. But guess what? Did he come out and master what he was asked to do? Um, I think that's that's a big part of the of the analysis too, is you know, he came out and I would say he ran that offense at a high caliber because he knew it because he understood it inside and out. Now, if there's more put on his plate, does he flounder? Maybe, but at the same time, he mastered what was in front of him. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I think there is some use to going back and watching like that Auburn tape a little bit, but it's to see what, to me, whenever I go watch anything more than two years back, it's always what have they changed? What have they developed? What has, you know, what techniques have they picked up? What mechanics have they improved to get them where they are? And when you go back and watch Bo Nix, he was a complete mechanical mess basically during his time at Auburn. And there was definitely time put in or time put in during his time at Oregon to correct those issues to where he was able to play better. Granted, he had much better talent. This is extremely talented Oregon team. That's going to see a lot of early picks over the next couple of years. And um, well, he was able to capitalize on that, but he was still leading them. He still played well. Now the big comparison is often drew Brees here. And I'm not going to ask you to make your own comparison for Bo Nix this time. Um, but for me, the Drew Brees, Drew Brees comparison is lazy and not great. Um, maybe you can, add, you know, give your own take on it and everything. But what what are your thoughts about this comparison of Drew Brees to Bonex? To me, I think the kind of the comparison falls short because Drew Brees, to me, Drew Brees was a master of the technical fundamental aspects of, of playing the quarterback position. And in many ways he had to, right? Because he just, he wasn't the biggest guy in the room. Um, and so I think he understood, Hey, in order for me to succeed and really be able to succeed at a high level, I've got to master the little things. And again, something where his feet are off like that for Bonex, I don't see him kind of being that similar you know, mastering, you know, a guy who didn't necessarily master his craft. Yeah, definitely. Now, see, for me, a better one comparison, and Bronco fans are going to hate this, but Zach Powers has it in the chat. I always see a little bit of more Teddy Bridgewater to Bo Nix than Drew Brees. I mean, the foot, Teddy Bridgewater had a great football IQ coming out. He was didn't have the best arms. Um, there are some, or best arm, there are some mechanical issues. There's a lot of similarities there. And that is a, to me, is a better comparison uh, for what Bo Nix is bringing than, uh, than Drew Brees is. And again, comparisons, they're not a one for one. Saying Bo Nix is similar to Teddy Bridgewater isn't saying that he will be Teddy Bridgewater. Just as saying Bo Nix is Drew Brees isn't saying he will be Drew Brees. Um, there's a use with comparisons. Um, depending on how you're using it, it can be you're trying to make a stylistic comparison. You're trying to, you know, compare a specific aspect to a player. Like this guy's arm strength is similar to this guy's arm strength. You know, just since we're talking about quarterbacks, comparisons they have a use, but they are definitely something that is a little bit over, um, overused and abused a little bit. Um, and 
uh, as a way also to generate clicks and create discussion. Now, with before moving on to Michael Penix here as the next quarterback, with Bo Nix, it's been a while since you've you know you've really had to put a round grade so to speak on him, but going back to the back when I first met you when you were covering the draft as well, where would you feel comfortable with the Broncos, you know, taking Bo Nix? Would it be twelve overall? Would you like to see them try to land him somewhere in the second with a couple of trade downs, or what? Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, I think we're starting to see NFL teams starting to get a little bit more desperate because at the end of the day, it's a quarterback driven league and it's it's a real I say it's always a 50 50 equation. Either you've got a guy or you don't have a guy. And if you've got a guy, you feel great. You feel secure. You're going to put all the pieces in place around to make sure that that guy can give you a great shot at winning a Super Bowl or you don't have that guy and you're trying like hell to find that guy. Um I do think that there's going to be a franchise out there that looks at a Bo Nix and says, hey, we feel like we can correct the mechanical issues there. We feel like we can coach that up because at the end of the day, you're going to have, you know, there's always different opinions. But one thing I'll tell you about a coach is every coach in, in the world in the sport of football is going to look at a, a freak athlete and say, hey, I see what I can turn that guy into. Because at the end of the day, you have to have that confidence. You have to have that belief in looking at someone and evaluating someone and saying, I don't see them for what they are right now, but oh, give me a couple years working with them and let me show you what they can become. Um, so I do think he's probably going to be in my, my guess, he's going to go day two, if not day one, because I think there's going to be teams who see that and say, Hey, we can fix this. We can work with this. We can coach this. We think this guy has the experience. He's seen it all and he can come in and, and be the guy for us. Whether or not that ends up being the case, I think in so many ways, depends on fit, depends on that situation where he ends up. Definitely. And we had somebody ask about Bo Nix's fit with Sean Payton's offense. And I asked you if you were very familiar with Sean Payton's offense. Um, but to me, it, the fit is fine um, with what, you know, this Gulf Coast variation that Sean Payton runs, you know, wanting to spread things out a little bit a little bit more and get the ball out quickly rely on that interior power interior gap schemes um gap concepts he can work with that uh, it's the issue becomes is when sean payton likes to dial up and he likes to dial up shots quite a bit can bo Nix do that consistently and that's where the hiccup of the fit comes for me anyways but as I've said, I would be fine with Bo Nix after a trade down or two, being able to land him somewhere in like the bottom, like five to 10 picks of the first round or the first five to 10 picks of the second round. Um, just part of that is also the status of the team. This roster is not that great. They need a lot of help. They're not in the best financial situation. They haven't had a lot of, you know, high caliber rookies coming in. The last couple of drafts have been questionable, though, you know, verdict's still out on them they can't sit there and really afford to use the 12th overall pick on a quarterback that from what I've gathered, most teams don't view as a first round quarterback. Um, obviously all it takes is one team, but it's just, you know, it just creates issues there. Now going to Michael Penix, um, the big thing with him is the injuries. And I'm not sure how familiar you are with the in all the injuries he's dealt with. Couple, uh, I believe two ACL injuries and two, two, shoulder surgeries as well um but one thing that people always talk about is just the natural throwing ability that Penix has um but obviously there's some questions about his maneuverability in the pocket you know issues with working the middle of the field what so to start off what are your general thoughts on Penix man was there any offense in college football this year more fun to watch than Washington <laughs> I mean it, it was just awesome, right? Like they went out and, and again, I will say this, you talk about throwing a football, man, Penix throw his deep ball. It's, it is exquisite. It is a thing of beauty. I mean, there is no wobble. That thing is a tight spiral. Yes. He's got a little bit of an elongated, like a longer throwing motion. Um, that's going to take a little bit longer to get out. You know, he doesn't have as quick of a release, but man, that ball jumps off his hand. It just jumps off his hand. Now, the downside of that is, right, he throws the, the heck out of the deep ball. How does he throw in the, in the intermediate? 
How does he throw short, right? Those are adjustments certainly that we're going to have to kind of decipher as scouts, as evaluators. Do we think he can do that in the league? To me, aside of the injuries, the, the concern that I have for Penix is at the end of the day, sometimes as a quarterback, one thing I'll say is this. We're all sitting here talking about quarterback. Quarterback is the most fundamentally unfair position in all of sports. I'll say it again. The quarterback position is the most fundamentally unfair position in all of sports because you are held to a standard as that one guy that not a single one of the other 21 players on the field are held to. You are held to a high standard. And to me, is it fair? Is it not fair? I'm not here to say that. But to me, he, in the, in the biggest game of his career to this point, the national championship game against Michigan, he wilted against the pass rush. And in the, in the Texas game where, you know, they had two guys on the interior who were arguably the two best players on the field, those interior Texas D linemen were just, just animals, right? And, and Washington did a great job and they gave him time to throw. And he's very, he's a master of extending the play outside the pocket and, and extending the play to, to be able to, to let that deep ball fly. But to me, the, the concern for me is, in that game, there's there's always that kind of the evaluation of a quarterback at the professional level is, hey, I'm right here in the pocket. I see my receiver broken out, breaking open. I'm getting ready to throw that football. And as I'm ready to throw this football, someone breaks through. And I know I'm going to take this one to the chest. I know I'm going to take a helmet just right to the sternum. It's going to hurt like hell. Am I willing and am I will, you know, am I able to step into that throw to get my receiver the ball to make the play? Am I willing to put my body on the line for my team as a quarterback where, you know, quarterbacks don't get hit in practice, right? They wear different color jerseys, right? To me, in a lot of ways in the professional evaluation process, that's significant. And to me in that, in that Michigan team, in that Michigan game, and to me, he, he kind of at times he shirked the responsibility of the moment um, and, and didn't step into that role, uh, step into that throw. Right. So to me, that that's kind of the knock against Penix is it's the injuries. It's, you know, that moment, you know, he's a, he had a heck of a season. He was a Heisman finalist. But man, there's some throws that I'm sure he wants back because, you know, I, I heard people saying it after the national championship game. Shoot. If Texas wins that game on a Hail Mary, aren't we having a different conversation about Michael Penix? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, earlier I mentioned about how, you know, other people's analysis of the people's thoughts will often get me to go back and watch. And there was an article I read after the national championship game about the difference of the way that Michigan pressured Penix versus Tennessee. And it was pretty enlightening because Byron Murphy, Devondre Sweat, Man, those two are incredible defensive linemen. But this whole article, the point, the whole point was, is that well, with a lot of quarterbacks, you want to get that interior pressure. Is Michael Penix, even though he's not really a scrambling quarterback, you want to put the pressure on from the outside and try to make him work his way back up into the pocket because that's where things start to fall apart for him. And went back and watched the Michigan game, and that's what they were really focusing on. They were keeping the edges tight on him to where he couldn't get out of the pocket. And again, that's not where he's great at and forcing the step up into what interior pressure they were able to get and just rattle him that way. And Texas, as good of a football team as they had, as they had as good as they did, they didn't really have much talent on the, on the out uh, with their outside rushers and their pass defense in general was a little bit lackluster. Um, so it was definitely something that, you know, caught my attention, went back and watched more games during the season and it was a pretty consistent issue that, from what I was able to see of when they were able to keep him inside the pocket, force him to step up, um, just more problems were. And then another one is watching a lot of him is, to me, I used to be a huge Penix guy. He was a guy that I felt was a first-round talent, and now he's barely in my top 100. Um, he has taken a fall for me. Um, just the more I watched, the more issues that I really started to see with him. And one of them is, as I like, as I've been, as I've called it, is an aversion to the middle of the field. There were multiple times throughout watching it, all, all of his games this last season, where there was a receiver open in the middle of the field, and he would have the shot there and go to a more difficult throw on the boundary. Now, I'm curious if you noticed any of that, and if you did, 
is that something that you can correct? Is that a is that a severe mental issue that might be a little bit harder to overcome with Penix or what the case there might be? Yeah, I think in terms of that, there's the, the, the beauty of playing quarterback, man, is there's so much gray area sometimes is is the receiver open or is he not open? Right. There's not like there's a little flashing sign that lights up over his head that says open. Right. Um, and so that's the beauty of playing the position is you can coach the guy through. Hey, here's when I'm looking at this, right? Here's how I would consider this as open or, Hey, maybe, maybe the defenders in this spot, right? That's why that's where the back shoulder throw comes in, right? Where the defenders kind of over the top of him, but I can throw that at his back shoulder. So now he's not open in the traditional sense, but if I put that ball in the right spot, yeah, I can throw him open, right? I can, with my throw, with my accuracy, I can put that in a position where he's able to go play that ball. Um, so yeah, I would, I would say in terms of that, I think there's a, a very a very real chance that you can work with that and that you can correct that. And, and you know, that's where I'm never sure with the team's progressions, what are they coaching? Are they coaching that route as maybe just an alert um, that they're just looking at it and they're trying to throw it game plan wise against a specific look. Um, that's where so much of quarterback play to me is challenging because I don't know. I don't know what it says in that playbook. Right. Or I don't know what it said in that install sheet for that week's game. Because shoot, man, they might be saying, "Hey, go pick on." You know, I'm making up a number. Go pick on number seven of the boundary, right? We want to, we want to expose that guy as much as we can. So yeah, maybe I'm going to pass up some more open throws just to, you know, trust my arm. And again, think about it: the quarterbacks got to be at a certain point. They've got to have some moxie. They've got to have probably more confidence than anybody on the field outside of cornerbacks. Like they've got to say, "Hey, I'm going to fit that ball in there." Heck yeah. Yeah, um, definitely. That's one thing that's always challenging, even with, you know, even with blocking concepts, even with all of that, is what are they being asked to do? What are they being coached to do? Um, and so we hear it talk. We hear it talked about a lot on broadcasts. Oh, corner, this corner went out. Well, now they've thrown at that corner, replacing them seven times out of eight. Um, so we hear it talk about it. But that's one thing that is always difficult to put into especially for me to put into the value or for anybody really to put into their evaluations um, with any position, but again, especially quarterbacks. Now I didn't ask you for Bonix, but I'm going to ask you with Penix. Cause to me, there's one comparison that comes straight to mind whenever I watch, watch Michael Penix. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on it. But first, if you had to make a comparison for Michael Penix, who would it be? Are you going to, are you going to throw a, Throw a Philip Rivers at me here. Throwing a Philip Rivers at you. Yeah, <laughs> I can I can see that because it's that wonky, weird arm motion. Yeah, no, I get that. I get that. I think to me, Rivers always there was just a little bit. And again, it's you know it's we're old enough that we probably remember you know those old school CBS graphics and you know <laughs> those good Sunday afternoon games in the mid two thousands. To me, there was always a little bit of a wobble with mm-hmm. Philip Rivers, right? where I don't know if he had quite the arm strength and that motion was just weird enough. To me, when I look at Penix mechanically with the arm, kind of that, that you know, the the that longer throwing motion, that kind of weird windup, yeah, I see Rivers in that. To me, he just throws such a clean football that is just, it's truly a joy to watch, right? You think of, and again, this is not a stylistic comparison by any means, but, you know, the probably the best deep balls in the NFL right now, who are we saying? Um you know, a Rogers, a, uh, a Lamar, right? It's those guys where that ball just jumps out of their hand, just freaking hops out of there like it's shot out of a cannon, tight spiral, and it just nestles down on the deep ball. To me, it's the arm action of Phillip Rivers, but man, he throws a pretty ball, doesn't he? He does. And th- that's one thing is like, it's so hard for me whenever I watch Penix to get beyond that throwing motion and just not see Rivers. But there are there are other quarterbacks out there to me, one thing with just how clean the ball is and just how it pops out of his hands, that aspect of it reminds me a lot of Stafford. Just mm-hmm. that raw arm, God-given ability to just sling yeah. that ball um, with ease over and over and over again. That aspect of it, I see a lot. I, I see a lot of Stafford and uh, have him compared. You know, with that aspect of him there. Um, There's another question I had with Penix, but it currently has escaped my my mind at the moment so two other quarterbacks that we talked about a little bit um or we haven't had a chance to talk about spencer radler and michael pratt why don't you go ahead and give me just a couple quick thoughts on those two quarterbacks 
Yeah, well, with with Rattler, to me, there's kind of the expression of jack of all trades, but master of none, right? He does certain things well, kind of to a, a good enough point, but where does he shine, right? Where does he excel? Where is it that he really um, lights it up? To me, he looks tentative. He's kind of all over the place. Um, accuracy is erratic. Things I like about him, um, and, and this is not by any means, this is not something to underrate is his offense asks him to play both from the shotgun and go under center. Um, and you think about it in college these days, shoot, you'll have quarterbacks who don't take a snap under center from high school, maybe all the way to the NFL, right? Yes. Everybody's going to kind of incorporate, you know, the, the Philly QB sneak, all that, and everybody's going to run their own variation. So yeah, you'll have quarterbacks get under center in high school, just to or excuse me in college, just to sneak the ball. But how many times are they getting under center to work a drop back, to work some kind of play action fake? You know, so for for him, the ability that he has shown within his scheme to be able to go and work through, hey, under center footwork, shotgun footwork, right? That's a lot on that's a lot technique wise for a quarterback. And I think he does a good job with it. To me, the the biggest, you know, you look at the start of the Clemson game for him, um, you know, couple turnovers early. And and he just kind of self-destructs. He loses momentum. And, and to me, that's that's the kind of the picture for Rattler is, hey, jack of all trades, master of none. What is what is he going to bring to the table that's going to allow him to really find success at the next level? Yeah, real quick. I just want to grab this. Jeremy, I was comparing one very specific aspect of Matthew Stafford and Penix, not overall, just the natural arm ability that they have. That was the straight comparison there between the two nothing else michael edel come in or mike edel came in a little bit earlier um i had a jump in my stream and then i forgot to go back and get this uh he says with the five dollar donation saying hey eric and coach how would you guys grade this quarterback class last year i don't think any quarterbacks are worth multiple first rounders um it's things like that are always tough because whenever you start getting comparisons to like, Oh, last year's class or next year's class, there's always a lot of different changes that, you know, a lot of variables that come into play. Um, one of them this year is how many teams are picking early that need a quarterback that obviously is going to change the value for what it's going to cost to get to get those quarterbacks, um, and move up and everything in straight value. I don't think it is, it's worth moving up for any of these quarterbacks, just because of that cost. I mean, you're looking at to compete with Minnesota, you're looking at three first round picks this year, next year, and the year after. And even then Minnesota can still outbid you and throw a fourth first round pick in there. Um, they have that ability to throw in a second round pick this year or, and a third round pick next year or something to help lower the cost of first round picks. They have a, um, a few different things that they can do, which makes it so hard for them to move up and get there. Um, now, uh, actually, somebody in the chat just actually made me remember what my uh, compare what my comment final comment, not so much a question about Michael Penix was. Now, with Michael Penix, I'm just curious to get your thoughts on this. Um, one comparison that I saw about him was Tua Tungo Veloa. Do you see outside of both being left-handed? Do you see any similarities there? I think sometimes when when there's lefty quarterbacks, right? How many do you see come through? Like, you know. That's one of those things where, yeah, the ball spins the other way. And sometimes to me, I, I don't know how how similar I see those guys being um, outside of, you know, arguably to a throwing one of the most famous deep balls in, in college, uh, you know, college championship history that throw in overtime to beat Georgia. Right. Um, so, yeah, he, he threw a, a nice ball and, um, you know, similarly to uh, how Penix throws it. But I, I, I would say for me, I don't know that they're super similar. I think two is a little bit more dynamic progressionally i think and again i'll say this one thing for me as a college football coach man i'll tell you i don't get to watch as much sunday action as i would like because saturdays we play then i you know once i you know get you know out of the office kind of wrap up all my post game breakdowns i get off the rest of saturday right so i'll just go home and plop down on the couch and turn on more college football because i love it because i'm passionate about it sunday I turn around, man. I'm back in the I'm back in the office finishing up from Saturday. I don't get to watch as much NFL stuff as I'd like. So when I say when I'm talking about Tua, I'm really kind of talking about college Tua because I don't know that I've uh, I don't know if I've seen too much of him since then. Truth be told, 
Yeah, I mean, I just had I just had to make that comment because when I when I read that, it was a uh, a bit of a shock because outside of being left handed, there I don't see any similarities between the two. Um, we won't have a, we don't have a lot of time, so we probably won't be able to talk about Michael Pratt. Um, were there any comments in chat that you really caught your eye that you wanted to address? I'll, real quick? Yeah, I'll just jump in on Pratt real quick, man. I I will say I liked what I saw. Um, you know, he he goes through progressions, puts the ball in a good spot. He's decisive in progressions, right? Like if he if he gets past the receiver, he doesn't come back to him later, right? Which is kind of the cardinal sin. Um, passes that kind of take a hit test, right? Where he's he he takes that helmet to the chin, but he gets the ball gets the ball out, gets to the receiver. Um, again, offensively in terms of scheme, I would probably put him kind of more on the Bo Nix end of the spectrum, simplistic offense rather than that J.J. McCarthy complex offense. But, uh, you know, for a guy who, you know, really I had, I had not heard much about kind of before sitting down and watching his tape, was impressed, especially with kind of the success Tulane has found uh, over the last couple of years. Yeah, and – you know, Michael Pratt, he's been often mentioned with Denver as that, you know, third or fourth round guy um, for them. And one of the things is his offensive line coach was, or the offensive line coach at Tulane, not his. Um, he was the offensive line coach for Sean Payton in New Orleans for so many years. So obviously there's some connection there and you can use always use that connection to get a little bit extra information about the guy. But that's probably going to do it for us. Um it's been great having you on. It's been great talking about quarterbacks. Now, uh, I, I guess before we get out of here, if you had if you had to rank the group, uh, what would your overall rank being from one be from one to six? I'm gonna hedge my bets on one because I think if you need a guy to be ready today to lead an offense, I think you know from the from the perspective of pro ready, I think McCarthy is more pro ready. I think he has the higher floor. But I think that Drake May has the higher ceiling, right? If you're going to gamble on being able to develop a guy, build him up, I would say he probably has the higher ceiling of the two. Um, so again, that's a, that's a kind of a one A one B. How how bad do you need to win your one, right? How bad do you need to win your one? How much are you going to be able to kind of build a guy up? Um, I'd probably put Nick's three because I think you can correct a lot of his mechanical uh, flaws there. Um, to me, I'm probably getting down to Penix and Pratt kind of similarly. I, I don't know if I buy all the way into Pratt's arm strength. To me, I had Rattler last. I just, I don't, I don't, I don't see any kind of one aspect where he really jumps out as succeeding. Um, just too erratic for me. Yeah. And one thing with Rattler and there's a lot of issues that I have on him. And obviously there's a lot of stuff from him with the maturity and stuff like that. You know, everything's been that he's grown. Um, but for me, one thing that it made his evaluation so difficult is over the last two years, I think they had the same starting lineup in back-to-back -back games like once. Like that offensive line, it was consistently, consistently poor, always beat up, always somebody missing. Um, and when you're he he had one of the highest pressure rates as well. And when you throw that in, it can make things a lot more difficult with the evaluation for it. Um, so Thank you again for joining us. Uh, thank you everyone in the chat for all your stars and super chats. We appreciate it. If you guys did get do, did donate some stars and we didn't get to it again, I apologize. I don't have Facebook up and we don't have Scott behind the scenes to point out which ones are stars or not. So I, I appreciate you all. You guys allow us to keep the lights on and keep doing what we do. Um, Luke, thank you for joining us again. It was a pleasure as always having you on. Something that I think every single year I mentioned that I want to get you on a little bit more often if we can, and just always ends up being one show. Um, so again, I appreciate you and you know, best of luck on the season and for spring training and all the coaching stuff, as well as coming up and uh best wishes for you and your wife now and as you come up and approach your one year anniversary. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. It's it's hard to believe it's almost been a year already. And I know it's it's only one show a year, but I, I hear a lot of people say it might be the best show every year. So, <laughs> you know, shoot, as long as I keep getting invites, I'll keep coming back. So thank you as always for the opportunity to come on and talk football. It's like I said, it's, it's what I get to do for a living. I'm passionate about it. It's, it's the best sport on the planet. Yeah, maybe we can get you on sometime over the summer months, you know, before the season picks up and, you know, actually talk about some Broncos offense 
and maybe one of these quarterbacks and what to expect out of them in the offense. Definitely we'll try can try to set something up like that. But thank you guys for joining us. Thank you guys as always. Next week, um, I'll be here for sure next week. Um, uncertainty about who will be joining me at this time. And it's can't believe that the draft is 20 days away. It's definitely, you know, in that uh, the final legs of the draft season. Still have a lot of articles coming up. They're going up at milehighhuddle.com. You guys can go and check those out. Um, there are something like 40 total, 30, 40 scouting report articles up. Make sure you guys go check them out, covering all sorts of uh, different prospects and everything. Thank you guys again for joining us. Have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe, and we will be back next week. Same time, same bat channel.